Thank you so much, Joel, and thank you, Vishan. Thanks, Joel, for the, for the kind introduction. That was great. And thanks for the invite uh, by you and Michon to be here. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be in Israel. It's actually my first time in Israel, so I am very excited. And I'm looking forward to actually see a little bit of sightseeing uh, in, uh, in coming days. So today, I'm going to talk about how do we develop, as a community, how do we develop an ethical visualization practice and build a better world, right? It's a very ambitious presentation. So first of all, maybe we can start with the basics. What is a visualization, right? What is a chart, a graph? A visualization is always a representation of a system, right? Or as famously Magritte would say, this is not a pipe, it's a representation of a pipe. And the same thing can be applied to maps and visualizations, right? I love this quote by Alfred Korzybski that says, the map is not the territory, right? It's just a representation of the system itself. But even more than that, it's actually a unique angle on the system of the many angles that you can take, right? A unique, specific angle. And whenever I talk about this and the importance of understanding this aspect of visualization, I always go back to this, which is probably many of you have seen this. This is arguably the most uh, famous Japanese painting of all times, right? The Great Wave of Kanagawa. But many of you don't know what is actually the main subject of the painting. I'm not going to ask because I know someone always knows the answer, but people might think it's the tsunami, right? Or it is like the fisherman's struggle with the sea. But the main topic, the main subject of this painting is actually Mount Fuji that you see very much in the, in the foreground, right? Of course, as we all know, it's the highest mountain in Japan. And more interestingly, this painting, and maybe you, many of you don't know this, but this painting is actually part of a series of paintings on Mount Fuji. In fact, 36 views of Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji seen from the cities, from the villages, from the fields, from the ocean, right? It's almost like if you have like a 360 degree camera taking shots of Mount Fuji from every possible angle. And the one, that famous painting is just one single angle of that Mount Fuji. So I use Mount Fuji as a metaphor for data sets, right? Whenever we are trying to visualize a system, right, a topic, a data set, that's your Mount Fuji. So there's multiple angles that you can take. This is just an example. Roughly 10 years ago, there was this challenge. There was this unique data set on the fall of meteorites on planet Earth. And there was a, a competition around it. The data set was released. And what I love about exercises like this is that it proves this point, right? The same exact data set was used. There was not a comma different from everyone that was employing this set of data. And yet, the outcome was immensely diverse. Look at the variety of data visualizations that were created using the very same data set, right? It's like, again, looking at Mount Fuji from all these different possible angles. But even more important, a visualization is always not just a unique angle, but a unique angle on the available data about the system. And that's something that we normally tend to forget. So the competition that I just showed you about the visualizations of the meteorites falling on planet Earth, this was actually the winning entry, the one that actually won first prize. What's interesting here is that if you look at the, the, the bar chart on the top, you might think that, wow, it seems like from 1900s, there's been a lot more meteorites falling on planet Earth, right? And of course, that's not true. There were probably falling meteorites since the beginning of time, right? We just didn't document those falls, right? So that's the important sort of caveat here is that any visualization that you see is always a unique angle on the available data that we have at that given moment in time. Another example I, leave, I like to give in this context is this beautiful <coughs> visualization, one of the most comprehensive visualizations of all species known to man, right? This intricate chart depicting 93,000 organisms, right? What's interesting is that 
a chart like this is always filled with biases, right? Not only do we research and pay attention to some species more than others, right? We especially love animals. We especially love uh, mammals. Uh, but this keeps on changing all the time as we acquire new data. You know, insects are to the animal kingdom what the deep sea is to earth, largely unknown to science. This, this is one of the insects that was released uh, and discovered by a recent uh, National Geographical article that fascinating across the, the Amazon rainforest. And this is one of many new species, right? So again, a visualization is always changing because the data is changing. Our knowledge and information about a given system keeps on changing all the time. Another take you can take on data visualization is by a simple definition, right? I think this is the simplest I've encountered uh, during my days. Data visualization is the presentation of data in graphical format. No need to say more, right? So what is the challenge, right? It's, it might seem simple, but then when you go to the challenge, we realize that it's, it's fairly more complex, right? The challenge for me is always, how do we effectively, elegantly, accurately, as well as ethically, communicate information? And today, I will really focus on this last underlined word, which is ethically. How do we actually do this in an ethical, moral fashion? We always go back to the process that it takes to put a visualization together, right? And there's multiple steps. You know, there's various charts and diagrams illustrating this, this process. I think this one is arguably one of the simplest, right? You basically collect data, you clean and analyze the data, and then you ultimately you visualize the data, right? The act, the act of visual depiction. And of course, within this process, uh, within these various steps of this process, there's always room for biases to trickle in, right? And this is where we need to be very attentive. So, from an ethical responsibility standpoint, I see it in three different steps. One is the data that we collect, right? That data sources should be reliable, right? Where did this data came from, right? How was it treated? And for this, you need awareness. You need to be really aware of where this data came from. Then there's the element of cleaning and analyzing the data. For me, this is one of the most critical ones because it's normally hidden, hidden from the end user, right? Hidden from the, the person that's actually consuming the, the visualization. So transparency here is absolutely paramount. And then finally, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one, is at the act of visualizing data. There's a lot of biases that can come in, and we're going to see some examples. So here, you really need to make sure that integrity is part of your ethical responsibility as a data visualization designer. So let's go over the first one, awareness, right? So data sources should be reliable and verifiable. I was mentioning that. Data is not neutral. We need to really, really understand that. There's no thing as neutral data, neutral technology, neutral design. It's as flawed, as biased as we are. We need to know where the data came from, OK? So this is actually an example that I mentioned in my latest book that Joel briefly mentioned. And it's the example of the redlining in the US. For those who don't know this uh, sad moment in history in the US, this was basically a time in the 1930s where the US, many neighborhoods in the US were literally divided, right? And given a given rating. And this rating was immensely racist because it was based on how diverse or colored a given area of that neighborhood was, right? So the lower the rating, the last propensity you had for colored people to live there, right? Immensely racist and a really sad history uh, within the US. Now, and of course, by a lower rating in a given neighbor neighborhood, it also uh, made it really hard for people to get credit to actually buy a house in that specific neighborhood. So it's really like a system that's self-enforcing in its, in its racism and, and um, disenfranchisement of people. So fast forward now, 90 years, and Amazon Prime 
releases its brand new service, right? And all of a sudden, it does this in a variety of different neighborhoods, a variety of different cities across, across the US. And what's interesting about this is that, for some reason, a lot of these like colored neighborhoods were, not, were excluded from the Amazon Prime service initially. And of course, there was a huge uproar in society in the US, like, this is completely racist, like, why are you doing this? And of course, Amazon, in their perfect Silicon Valley style, said, it's not our fault, it's the algorithm. There's no way an algorithm can be racist, right? Now, the fun fact is that this you know, neutral algorithm was using this data set from the 1930s that was ingrained in the US Boris system, right? So we see here our racism is still playing a role almost 100 years later, right? And using what it's meant to be a neutral data set or neutral algorithm. So our role, our responsibility as a data visualization designer, engineer, is always to question, okay? Always. Where did this data came from, right? How was it treated and transformed? Who benefits from it, right? And what was its original goal, right? This is super critical that we ask those questions while we are acquiring this data. We should not just take data freely without, without questioning. So the next aspect I want to highlight is the importance of transparency. And I think this is always critical in many visualizations, and I wish there would be more elements of transparency. What I mean by transparency is that, again, attribution should be given whenever possible. Be transparent on where this data came from, how it was treated and filtered, okay? So this is a simple example from The Economist. I think The Economist is really well. It, they are very, very clear and transparent about what data is being used, how it was treated, what areas are of the data set are actually being used. I think it, you know, these are just a few other examples. You can actually explain how the data itself was treated, right? Explain, this is how it, where it came from, this is what it was excluded, this is what it was included, right? And sometimes even have a link to the data set. That's a, the, the, the highest level of transparency you can get because don't believe me, you know, if you really want to see the raw data, this is it, this is where I came, this is what I got this data from, you can use it yourself, right? And again, we spend a lot of time visualizing the ultimate angle of this ecosystem. Maybe spend some time actually explaining, again, how the data was processed, right? How it was treated, what things, what elements of the data was cha were changed. Like, this is normally completely hidden from the end user, right? And I think having that level of transparency on data, collect data collection, data analysis is absolutely paramount when it comes to ethical responsibility. But now comes the fun, the fun part, right? It's the visual decoding element that we all love, right? Translating that into imagery, into graphical representation. And here again, integrity is our call. We need to be really aware of what we are doing. So I divided this in three different areas. One of them is about honesty, okay? So I love this pie chart, it's so beautiful and clear. Um, don't let design choices distort or obfuscate your facts and analytical findings, right? Make sure what's presented accurately represents what's in the data. I'm sure you are a very knowledgeable audience. I don't need to explain too much why this pie chart is not working that well. <laughs> but, you know, there are also things that are subtle, you know, things like 3D representation on bar charts. We all know this is a deceiving practice, right? because it makes it hard to actually understand the differences in heights for bars, let's say. Also, something that you should not do, this should go without saying, is any 3D representation. So 3D pie charts, again, very knowledgeable audience, I'm sure, but the example, of, the example A, when it's distorted to set that extent, 25% looks like it's almost the same as 75% in terms of area, right? So you should not really play. And maybe this should also go, go without saying, but don't put bananas on, on, on bar charts as well. It's not a great choice. <laughs> it just creates a lot of noise and it's hard. But of course, 
joking aside, 3D bar, bar charts, especially when it's like multi-series, it's an absolute nightmare. If you are creating pie charts, make sure they actually add up to 100, right? <laughs> so that should be, again, like the basics one-on-one -on, -one on data visualization. But again, this element of integrity, and there's actually a lot of blogs dedicated to uh, our Fox News creates a great amount of like this really interesting and deceiving, uh, deceiving graphs and charts. There's so many of them, it's even hard to, to make fun anymore. And of course, there are things like removing the zero baseline. We all know this is a practice, and I think people that have seen this for a while cringe every time we see like a chart that does not use a baseline, a zero baseline, only because we know how easy it is to mislead an audience, right? All of a sudden, the chart on the left looks like, my God, you know, if you want to show this to your manager, to your director, to your VP, I'm sure he or she will become very impressed by this immense growth. But of course, you're really lying to yourself and you're lying to others that you show because as soon as you put the zero line, you know, the growth is very, very, very subtle. Uh, even things like aspect ratio, we don't really pay enough attention to this, but it's really easy to mislead an audience by just changing the aspect ratio. This is the same line chart on three situations, right? But the one on the bottom looks like you know, just it's declining, but it's not as dramatic as the example on the top right, right? So changing that aspect radio makes a huge difference in the message you're trying to convey and communicate. So very similar to that, the idea of honesty in data visualization is the idea of clarity. And I love clarity because I think clarity is a form of honesty. You're not really doing your job. You're not being honest to yourself or to your audience if you are making things 10 times harder to understand, right? So things like headers, labels, axes, explanatory text, all of that matters in the chart. You know, examples like this. I cringe when I see this, like I have to turn my head, I have to understand data, it's like, it is like, so clear, and then you have like a full, the whole month and day, it's like, it's just a nightmare. Um, if you're doing icons as well, iconography, don't rely on iconography alone, right? We need more and more we live in a global world and not all, all icons are understood by audiences across the globe in an equal way. So every time you use icons, also have text next to them so it's more accessible. Also, be aware of abbreviations and technical jargon, specifically for non-technical audiences, right? So again, clarity, right? Instead of like CPC, just put it in words that people actually understand, humans understand, okay? Especially again in a context that not everyone is on the same page, not everyone understands this topic as well as you do. I think here I have to mention the importance of titles. Sometimes this is something that it's not taught in design schools maybe as often as I would like. So here it's the same exact chart, right? The only difference is in the title. So on the, the, the example of on the left, I have to do a lot of the legwork myself. I see uninsured Americans, okay. Now I have to understand the chart. I understand that it's on the decline. I understand the, the exact percentage that's declining. Instead, look at the example on the right side, the same chart. But instead of this generic title, they say America's uninsured rate dips below 10%. It's almost like the title is already telling me the full story. And then the graphical, right, the chart itself, just proves it. It becomes evidence of what the title is actually telling me, the message that it's actually telling me. So that's a great example of using titles wisely. I also love giving this example uh, because, again, the importance of a title and context, right? So what you see on the left is a super famous, it won multiple awards, it's called Iraq's Bloody Toll, right? Everything is powerful, everything is poetic, you know, of course, there's the color red representing blood. Of course, it's an inverted bar graph, so it's actually, it actually seems like it's dripping, right? Blood is dripping from a wall of some sort. So it's a really powerful and evocative piece that won multiple prizes. Now, the only thing they did, the example on the, on the right side, is that they inverted it and changed the color. That's it. It's exactly the same chart. But now look at the title, Iraq, that's on the decline. 
Because if you notice from the example before, you actually see that, yeah, it drips. It drips a lot of blood, you know, in the middle point, but then it actually comes back again. So that's, we're actually on the decline, right? And I love this example because it's such a subtle change. It just inverted the graph, changed the color, gave it a different title, and the message could not be more different from one to the other, right? So the importance of, of, of the title matters tremendously. And then finally, you cannot really talk about integrity when it comes to data visualization. We talk talking about respecting the end user, right? And I think a lot of times it means respecting their differences, right? It means respecting their impairments, their own disabilities. Not everyone is alike. We are all different and unique, and we have our own set of skills, right? So really respect the user in their full magnitude as humans. So accessibility plays a huge role when it comes to depicting uh, data. So this is just a, a simple example. There's, of course, many more examples when it comes to, to color accessibility. But you know, any type of color blindness that affects mostly males, right? it's a huge issue. right? And this is an example of the same heat map on the left right? that hopefully most of us will see <laughs> the greens and the reds. But unfortunately, not all of us see that. right? Roughly 10% of US males would look at that heat map on the left and would see the example on the right. Right? Shades of brown that look very much alike. The green and the red look alike with people with that specific uh, uh, issue. But it's not just about color accessibility. Accessibility touches so many different areas and points. One of them is, of course, for visually impaired users. Not just completely blind people, but people with, with uh, problems of, of, of sight. Right? So screen reader output, let's put emphasis on screen reading. It's a beautiful thing. We've done a lot of exercises in, at Google in the past on how do we actually get to explore the visualization through a screen reader output, which I have had this experience. I've once had to explain what I do as a living for a blind person. And it was one of the most frightening things in my life because I, I really lacked words. And that rarely happens you know, for me to like actually have no words to, to say anything. It was very humbling as an experience. So again, this notion of empathy and putting ourselves in the shoes of others and knowing how they will have to consume a visualization like this, specifically one that's very important to their daily lives. And of course, for people that have other types of impairments, you know, with their hands and gestures, uh, keyboard navigation and shortcuts is also absolutely paramount, right? The, allowing people to not be able to use the mouse and still have something out of this specific visualization. <coughs> so, we talked a little bit about the ethical responsibility according to three different areas, right? One is awareness, right? Understanding where this data came from, right? Asking the right questions, the notion of transparency, citing and explaining how the data was actually treated, and of course, integrity, right? Be honest, right? Be clear, not don't mislead the, the audience by creating charts that are harder to read or in fact could be lying to an audience. But do you think that's the full story? I look at this and in many ways, I think it only tells off the story of what our ethical responsibility should be like. And whenever I think about this, and this is something that I explore more closely in, in my latest book, I look at this blue marble that all of us inhabit, right? Without boundaries, without uh, languages, without cultures. And this little blue marble is filled with human suffering, with, with pain, with tragedies of all types, right? Just recently, in the past few years, we have seen three ones, right? Of course, COVID, you know, the earthquake in Turkey, and of course, the, the crisis in Ukraine, right? And what do we do as a community? And I, I include myself. What do we do as a community when we see this happening? We do charts, right? And these are just examples of the types of charts that we put out, right? And we, of course, we data visualizers, but also the media at large. Now, do you think, if you were to look at those charts, do you think they invoke the right level of empathy uh, towards those humans that are suffering? Do you think it, it evokes 
a sense of urgency and action that's needed to make a change? Probably not, right? If anything, it's kind of like a chart overload, right? And the more charts we see, the more tired, the more numb we become to it. And there's actually a name for this, which is called statistical numbing. This is actually a real thing that happens. People, it's a psychological phenomenon that makes people, all of us, indifferent to the suffering of large numbers of people. We simply stop caring, right? And we are to blame. You know, there's no responsibility. There's no reason why we should blame someone else. We are the ones to blame for this. As Joseph Stalin, well, I never thought I would put Stalin in, in one of my slides, but this is a first. Because in this context, it's actually something very chilling that he actually mentioned. One death is a tragedy, a million deaths is just a statistic, right? So every time we depict humans on a chart, every time, every time we put humans on a chart, they become an abstraction, right? Or even worse, it becomes a form of moral disengagement. And I talk extensively about moral disengagement and ethical fading in my book. We simply detach ourselves from our moral resp responsibility. So how do we avoid losing our humanity, you may ask? Well, in my view, there's of course different ways you can tackle this question. Maybe there's not a perfect answer. But I think at least, right, we should include a fourth step in this process that we just mentioned. And this, pro this step is really about steering the right level of emotion that leads to meaningful action, right? And a lot of this goes through empathy. And of course, I can talk about empathy nonstop and ways to achieve this. Even empathy as an individual, there's so much you can do as an individual to become a more empathetic person, which is, makes you as a person better for your friends, for your family, for your loved ones, etc. But when it comes to building empathy within vis data visualization, there's a few things that I think we can do. One of them is what's known as the depth of processing. Making sure that people actually retain this information, right? And it really touches them at a very intimate level. So depth of processing is really a phenomenon in memory in which information that is analyzed deeply is better recalled than information that is analyzed superficially. Anyone that has thought a class knows, or even as a student, we understand how that is true, right? If you have texts, if you also have images, if there's a questionnaire, if there's an interactive sort of way of learning this information, all those pieces do really add up in you recalling information. So what can we do? What? One of them is, uh, in this context, enable multivariate analysis, right? As Edward Tufty says, nearly all the interesting worlds uh, we seek to understand are inevitably multivariate in nature. Of course, I always have to show this. I'm not going to, everyone probably knows this. It's what's considered by Tufty the most interesting or the, the better data visualization of all times. But this is also a great example of multivariate analysis in the sense that it includes multiple variables to explain a given process, right? To explain the deaths of thousands and thousands of soldiers, right? On their march uh, from, from France on their march to Moscow. And explains that by showing temperature, by showing river crossings, by showing a variety of different things uh, to complement the chart. Another thing we should think about is Instead of just dots on the chart, let's use interactivity, right? Interaction design to make sense of things, uh, to filter, to analyze, to really like go to the nitty gritty details. And if that dot is a human, let's get to know more information, more demographics, maybe imagery of, of that single human. Let's dig in, right? Into that specific visualization as a means to tell me more and for me to actually recall this information in a better way. Another way that we can do, and I'm happy that Alicia is going to talk about this uh, after me at some point, is enable multisensorial experiences. If you haven't seen this beautiful piece called The Fallen of World War II, 
it's, I mean, it, in my view, it should won an Oscar. It should have won an Oscar of some sort because it is one of the most incredible visualization pieces ever created. And I think it is so by exactly exploring this multisensorial nature that you see not just beautifully crafted charts and graphs, but also there's imagery, there's sound, there's videos, and the whole experience becomes really immersive and you feel like you are inside of it. So the sense that how, how much you recall information and how much it touches you at a very personal level is absolutely dramatic and something that a single child will never be able to do. And of course, this comes into exploring other senses as well. Senses of smell, sensors of sound, right? We should really embrace these new technologies to, you know, to really break out of our little box and our little charts. I remember this, this, this time where I had a friend at Google and they, he was part of like the whole virtual reality team and they do like sprints, design sprints every two weeks, they try something else. And one time they had a sprint around data visualization, right? And he came to me and said, hey, you need to come and see what we are doing. And, you know, I put this crazy goggles on and I tried like not to fall back or hit something. And then what I see was incredibly disappointing because what they had done was like part bar charts and pie charts in a 3D space. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like here we have like a whole different set of technologies that could I don't know, have balloons exploding on the air, like do some crazy things, like really explore this new platform, this new medium. And here we are reusing the old metaphors of the past, right? So I think we should really be bold about taking a lot of these new technologies to explore this type of multisensorial experiences. And then finally, I think one way to really invoke empathy is what's known as anthropographics. And this is an area of study that's fairly recent, I would say, but I, I absolutely love that we are focusing on it as a community in this moment in time. So the purpose of anthropographics is really about how do we visualize data in a less abstract way, again, to invoke empathy and connection to our fellow humans. And they go through a series of uh, techniques that can lead to this, right? Of course, a single dot is just an uh, absolute abstraction, but that dot is a human being, right? So how can we convey, how do we go from like this level of abstraction to more a more realistic portrayal of what a human actually is, right? From generic to unique, right? I have a unique silhouette. Funny how sometimes even the layout matters tremendously. Here we see the difference from an orthog or orthogonal grid on the left and a more organic layout. And your impression is very different automatically. And this was just a single change in layout. It's kind of funny how the mind works, right, in many of these respects. And this is not accidental. Like the piece that I was mentioning, the Fallen from World War II, they actually make a lot of use of this. And notice that every single silhouette you see on that screen is not identical, right? They go to that extra effort of one soldier represents 1,000 soldiers. So the, the, the layout, the uniqueness of the representation is absolutely uh, critical to, to this view. And perhaps not by accident, I love how the New York Times have been really embracing this change in the zeitgeist, right? So all of us have seen this beautiful chart on the, the, the left side. I say beautiful because in a way, in a way it's really well conceived. There's some elements of, of elegance in the way it was conceived by adding this accumulated, by the way, dots there are actually people that died from COVID in the US, right? So there was a sense of time, there was a lot of death in the beginning, right? And then there was like different, you can see the different stages, right, of the uh, epidemic. But there was also a lot of criticism to this chart. Well, first of all, it should take the whole freaking page, right? There's still like articles about unrelated articles on that page that again removes that element of, of how serious this issue really is. But then of course, these are all dots on the screen, right? So the New York Times tried to sort of like, well, yes, okay, so we are listening to our audience. We understand humans are not just like a dot on the screen. So then they released this other chart that actually lists the full homepage and it's a list of all the people with the names listed on them. And then they also tried this more anthropographic type of view where you see 
again, different silhouettes on the right side. And sometimes, and of course, a lot of the work they do, you know, can really, there's a pride in craftsmanship and attention to detail there. And you can see all the people, right? And some individual stories on that person. So, in, and in, they also tried imagery in some cases. So you see this, this, almost this journey from like abstraction to, you know, reality, to realism, and really evoking a lot of those emotions in, because again, we are talking about real people that died sometimes in a very painful way. And this is, you know, the really kind of the last slide uh, on this is very recent, you know, straight out of the oven uh, from two, 2022. And this paper, if you haven't seen it, I really encourage if you are interested in anthropographics, it's a beautiful paper because it really set the tone for a variety of different techniques and approaches from granularity, specificity, coverage, right? Uh, again, physicality, all about this notion of going from abstraction, you know, to become more, much more real and connected to human, humans and human suffering altogether. Right, so here we have, I think this is really my sort of my recipe that I leave you today on ethical responsibility when it comes to data visualization as a community, right? Awareness, transparency, integrity, and empathy. I will close this, my last I would be like a heart shape around those things, because I think all of those together are really what the world needs more and more uh, today. And as Joel was mentioning, uh, I do talk about this and many other topics related to ethics and, and myths in design. Uh, not so much about data visualization, even though I do touch a few of them, but the design as a whole. So if you are interested, the book just came out literally two weeks ago, available at fine bookstores everywhere. And, um, and I actually have a copy. I actually have a free copy that I would love to sign to the person who asks the best question. And I do think we still have like seven minutes for questions, which is perfect. So many times to actually think about the best question from the audience. And thank you so much.